Well, good morning, South Point Church. How are we doing this morning? Come on, you guys are clearly excited that it's a new face this morning on stage. So I'm really excited about that. Well, as you just heard, my name is Kyle. I'm part of our youth ministry and our production team here at South Point Church. We've been a part of this church for seven months now. Can you believe it? Feels like years. But we've been here for seven months now. Um, firstly, I do want to also say to our leadership team, I really appreciate just you allowing me to, to speak here this morning. It's no small thing. So it is my joy this morning to speak to all of you guys. But before that, I want to introduce you guys to my wife. So that's my beautiful wife over there, Taryn. Um, so all the single ladies, I am taken, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but she is my beautiful wife. She's a blessed woman because she's married to me. Um, the Lord has blessed us. Um, there's a sort of a, a, a visual of our wedding. Now, I, I, I do have to say this. So um, from everything, from our suit, our clothes, our venue, our foods, everything, we literally plan our wedding in three weeks. Can you believe that? And here's the reason why, because she was pregnant. I'm kidding, guys, that's a joke. <laughs> I just really had to add that in there because it just makes it feel a bit more weighty. But um, we are married for seven months now. Um, we've moved down to Cape Town from beautiful KZN. Um, so we've been a part of this church. And I do want to say that um, what makes South Point Church really special is really the people. So I really want to thank all of you guys just for allowing us to be part of this family. Our tagline is a church to call home family to call your own, and we've really sensed that we're part of this family. So I just really want to also thank you guys for that. So well done. Um, this morning, we are starting a series called Voices. So this is part one of this series called Voices. I'll be speaking this morning around the idea of finding the right thing in the wrong place. Now, before I go into the Bible here, yeah, I want to share a bit of a personal story with you. So my mom raised me as a single parent. So single mom, alongside with her parents, um, her mom, her dad, they took up the, the initiative to raise me as a child. Now obviously my mom, her name is Jackie, not the Virgin Mary. So she needed someone in order for her to make a baby. Um, so that is my dad, okay? So my dad said, you know what, this is a beautiful looking boy, like this like, he looks good. You know, he's a special child. He needs special milk. Anyway, he went out. He went to go find this milk. To be honest, I'm still waiting for that. <laughs> still waiting for that milk. It still has not come. But um, so that really started inside of me, or, or rather it built a void inside of me that I needed filled. Because single parent, dad is not there going to school, hearing everyone talk about their fathers, what they did on the weekend, and I could never share the experience because he was not around for that. And that created inside of me a low view of myself. It really knocked the way I see myself, my confidence, everything related to that. So I saw myself as just another person in the crowd. I didn't feel valued, I didn't feel loved because of that situation. So it led me to go and find the right thing, which was love and acceptance. It led me to go and find that in the wrong place. And that is the story for us this morning. It's so easy for us to go and look for the right thing in the wrong place. Now, I genuinely believe I'm a funny guy. So whether you don't believe that, that's completely up to you. But I believe I'm a funny guy, okay? So that sort of shaped my identity because I wanted to be accepted. I wanted to be loved. So then I, I formed a clique, and they accepted me because they thought I was funny. So that sort of became my gift to the world, is that I can actually present something to them for them to accept me. And so often we find ourselves looking for a quick fix in order for us to be validated. Now that isn't my identity, but it is who I pretended to be. Because I didn't want people to see I've got scars, I have a void inside of me. And then eventually what also happened is that because I had a void inside of me, I became the class joke. 
I became a class clown. So the class clown would normally mock on kids, bully kids, simply because I have a void inside of me. So, so there's nothing wrong with the kid next to me. It's just because I wanted him to experience the same sort of pain. And we're going to look at this verse in the Bible, or rather passage in the Bible. It's found in John 4, and it's about this woman that Jesus encounters. He meets her at a well, and it says this, Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although it was not Jesus himself, but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And the next verse says this. Now, here's the amazing idea of this, is that God, Jesus, he doesn't have to do, he doesn't have to do anything because he's God. But it says here that Jesus had to pass through Samaria. Now, a little background of this is that the Jews and the Samaritans, they absolutely hated one another. The Jews thought that the Samaritans were less than them, it's not on the same level as them, not on the same sort of status as them. So the Jews would do everything in their power to avoid Samaritan people. So they thought that the Samaritans were less than them. It's sort of like the all black supporters, right? Like if you support the Springboks, you think the all blacks are less than you, which you might be, which actually might be the case. Um, but it's a joke, guys. I don't, I don't watch rugby at all. I don't care about rugby. I just thought it would work well here. It is what it is. So it says that he had to go through Samaria. Now, there's two scenarios here is that the route that Jesus actually took geographically is the shortest route, okay? But I don't believe that Jesus only took this route because it is the shortest route. There's this fancy theological word called providence. So providence basically is this. It is the personal guidance of God, okay? So I believe that God, Jesus, not only took this route because it's the shortest, but it, it was because God led him through that route, defying cultural, racial barriers in order for Jesus to encounter the woman at the well. Now, I'll share a bit of a personal story as well with you, is that when I was six or seven years old, it's one of the two, it's, a long, it's long ago, um, six or seven years old, we took a family trip down to Hermanus, okay? So we passed through Salodis Pass. It was a wet day, it was a cold day, it was a rainy day. Now, my grandfather, he's not a lot of things, but he's a very fast driver, okay? He speeds, he speeds. So as we went up Salodis Pass, speeding, he actually took the turn wrong. Because the road is wet, the car span around and we knocked the curve of the mountain, okay? So no one died, which is an amazing story, so no one died, but medically, what happened in my brain, in my mind, because of the shock thereof, because you could literally see down the mountain. So as a child, I was shocked so what had happened is it actually affected a nerve that eventually affects your speech, okay? So from the age of seven to 17, I had a stutter problem. So what that basically means is that you're just in first gear, okay? Like the song is playing, but the CD has a scratch on, okay? <laughs> That's a visual for you guys. So from the age of, of seven to 17, I had a stutter problem. So first and foremost, I had problems with my father, already feeling a void. Now I've got a stutter. I felt very low. Because now I can't even read in school because everyone is going to mock me. And I'm so afraid of everyone finding out I have a stutter. I wouldn't speak in school. If I knew it was on Wednesday, I would say zero. I'm fine with that. I don't care because I was so afraid of speaking in public. So speaking to you this morning, actually God has a funny way um, that I've been speaking all my life now, <laughs> which is incredible. And uh, that is simply to show you the providence 
of God. That is the personal guidance of God. So God, Jesus, went through that route, not because it's the shortest way, but because Jesus had a plan to why he needed to go there. Is that Jesus had a plan with my life as well. Actually, my last year of school, so I was about to study law because my family is either a doctor or a lawyer. So there isn't, there isn't another option. So now when I'm at my family's house and they ask me, how's the job? Oh, actually, what are you up to? I'm like, I'm a lawyer because I actually defend the case of Christ. So there we go. I'm a doctor because the church is a hospital for the broken. There we go. So I, I went into that. I wanted to study law. But then God and his providence had another plan for me. I went to Bible college of all places. Can you believe that? I went there with the idea that I want to get to know this God more. And I went there, and it was completely different. So I went there. They asked me to speak in public. I said, there's no way. I can't do this. I left the program, and then I was done with it. The whole week, like, done. Next week, I went back to them. I said, guys, I'm not sure what you got lined up for this day, but I'm ready to speak. I want to speak that day. Because I believe that God saved my life. If I hand him my weakness, there's so much more he can actually do with my life. And I handed my weakness to him. And providence of God is that I've been speaking all my life now. And I love it. I love it. But if I was going, looking for the right thing in the wrong place, I needed to hand my weakness to God and say, God, you can use me as you wish. And so many times we find ourselves, we're actually trying to make it work on our own, but it leaves us wanting more. It leaves us feeling unsatisfied because we're trying to do it in our own strength. So we see this woman here in John 4, and it says this, so he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside this well. It was about the sixth hour. Now, a bit of backstory is that women in that culture would normally go in the morning, early morning, or late at night. But this woman found herself there at the sixth hour, which is essentially in the afternoon. And she found herself there for one reason, because she knew if she was going to go there at the sixth hour, there was going to be no one. Because this woman was the talk of the town. She had a reputation. They were shaming her. So she chose a convenient time where she knew that there would be no one. There would be no one to shame her. There would be no one to also ridicule her because she chose that hour because she knew the culture. And it says this, a woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. So here you see Jesus finding himself, here he's finding him there at the well with this woman. So that is essentially where her story starts, where her encounter with a savior starts. Now I wanna ask you the question here this morning, what is the well you find yourself at? Like, what is the well you need to meet Jesus at this morning? And I know maybe for a few of you, you're not sure what it is. This morning, we all here collectively, we're finding ourselves here at the well at South Point Church. And Jesus is here. Is that we can encounter, just like this woman, we can encounter this Jesus because he's here. And we're finding ourselves, we're positioning ourselves this morning right here at the well of South Point Church. And it says here that the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask me for a drink? A woman of Samaria. For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. We're going to move on. Okay, they're going to move on just now. All right. All righty, I'm just going to tell it off by heart. Jesus answered her. <laughs> I'm sorry, it, it is actually in the back. There we go. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him. So this just sounds like Jesus a flirt here. It's like, uh, if, if you really knew, like you would have asked me, girl. 
<laughs> just, just slick, Jesus. That's just slick. Okay? Give me a drink. You would have asked him, and he actually would have handed you living water. So here we see the contrast between water and living water. Water that, that will not fulfill you, and water which will fulfill you. And we read on, it says, The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? So this is sort of a snarky, sort of a comment here of this woman, which is saying that, are you actually greater than our father Jacob? He actually gave us this well, and he also drank from it. And so did his sons and his livestock. And Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. That's an amazing verse there where it says that, you know what, we can find ourselves at a well. We can find ourselves actually, actually also drawing water from a well. But the water that we might find ourselves at, that it will leave us thirsty again. So I want to ask you this question is, where are you drawing from this morning? Are you drawing from a source that will leave you wanting more? Or are you, are you actually drawing from a source that's more sustainable? Which is essentially what Jesus is saying here, is that where are you actually finding your water from? Because the water that I give, you will never thirst again. Now I have an example here, which I'm gonna show you guys for all of the visual learners. So for example, like here's a woman, she found herself in the relationship after relationship, looking for fulfillment. And it never sustained her. It never fulfilled her. And that's the same with us. We can find ourselves walking in life, journeying in life, finding fulfillment in the wrong things. We're looking for the right thing because there's nothing wrong with wanting to feel love or, 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 or maybe valuable, but because you're finding it in the wrong place. For example, this is what we do, is we go from relationship after relationship and it's always leaking out. It's never sustainable. You can find yourself in a marriage, but it's never sustainable. You can find it in success, but it's never sustainable. It's always leaking out. And essentially, Jesus is saying is, what you are drawing with and where you are finding it is always leaking out. It can never be sustainable. It will never satisfy you. Pornography can never satisfy you. People pleasing can never satisfy you because it's gonna go in, you're gonna get a, it's gonna be an easy hit, but it's gonna leak out and you're gonna have to go draw back again. So Jesus is showing her that where you are drawing your water from, it's not sustainable because it's always leaking. Because essentially it is here is that living water is not found in a well. Living water is found in a savior, and his name is Jesus. And Jesus can do what he has actually done for the same thing he can do for us here this morning. If we realize, you know what, I'm looking for the right thing. I've been, I've been working it out on my own, but I find myself wanting more. It's never satisfying. Maybe the question you need to ask yourself is, am I going to the wrong place? Am I finding true fulfillment? in the wrong place. And we're gonna move on here. It says, the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty again or have to come draw water here again. So essentially this woman, she's saying, I'm, I'm sick of having to come back and back and back again. If you got this magic juice here, Jesus, please, I want that. So she's defying everything her parents told her, not to speak with a stranger or to take a gift from a stranger. So she's doing it here, okay? So she's defying some boundaries here as well. And it says that, so that I never have to come draw water again. And Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. Now this is where the story gets really dramatic, like Siavan the Lion, it's hectic. Okay, so Jesus says to her, go call your husband and come here. Now I've realized this as I read this, is that in order for this woman to be set free from where she finds herself at, 
in order for her to be healed, she had to realize, you know what? Here's a man that knows everything about me. I don't have to hide from him because he, went, he came all this way, passing through geographical barriers, racial barriers, cultural barriers. He came all this way to meet with me because the fact of the matter is, church, that we are fully known and we are fully loved. And the reason Jesus went all this way, he's defying everything about society here, is simply because of love. Simply because he had to go and meet a woman, and he had to explain to this woman that I, what I can give you is far better than where you're finding your fulfillment in. Because Jesus already knows us. So there's no need for us to hide. We can, we can say, God, Here's who I am, and I know that you love me. And it says this, it says that the woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are absolutely right. You have no husband, for you've had five husbands. Can you believe that? I've got one wife, it's enough. Okay, <laughs> can't imagine five. You've had five husbands, and the one you are now with is not even your husband. So what you are saying is absolutely true. But in order for, for her to be set free is that she could have easily span a story for Jesus because she's already dealt with this. She's already dealt with this, so it's easy for her to make a story and say, you know what, it's this and it's that and it's that. But in order for this woman to experience freedom, she needed to be real about where she found herself. And it's the same with us this morning is we can mask ourselves off, we can wear a filter if we like, but in order for us to be free, set free this morning and be healed of our shame and of our scars this morning, we have to be real about where we find ourselves. I had to be real and say, you know what, God? I, I've, I've actually tried to improve myself. So funny is this is that my mom also discovered this about me. So she said, we need to get you to a speech doctor. Funny story is, when I actually got there, my speech was fine, right? <laughs> I could read, I could speak, everything is clearly. But Monday at school, I'm t -t 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 -t. So funny story is that, right, is that it, it, whenever I got there, it always seemed to work. But I had to be honest with God and say, God, you know what? We've actually tried everything. I'm going to hand this to you. I'm going to be real about where I find myself. And I handed it to God. And I said, God, do with it what only you can do. In order for me to be set free from all the opinions or how I might be seen, I needed to be honest with where I found myself, which, is what, which was at a hopeless stage. There was nothing I can do. Because whenever I go there, I speak fine. So there's nothing I can do about it. But when I handed it to God, I was able to find healing and be set free from that. And it's the same with us this morning is, we need to be real. We, we find ourselves here at this well this morning, but we have to be real in order for us to be set free this morning. And, and I'm gonna move on here and it says that, so the, sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. The woman said, I know the Messiah is gonna come and he's called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. So essentially, here yeah, you find this woman, she's wondering who is this man that's asking her for a drink, etc., etc. skeptical. She's very amazed by Jesus now at this point because Jesus essentially told her everything about her. She didn't know who Jesus was, but Jesus knew who she was. So she's amazed by this. She's saying, sir, you must be a prophet. And eventually, so this is never the style of Jesus. He was always like secretive about who he is, right? So here we find Jesus revealing actually to this woman that I am actually the Messiah. I am he. I am the one you speak of. So there's no reason for you to wait because I am he. So you don't have to wait for the Messiah to come because he's here. And it's the same with us here this morning is that we don't have to wait. 
Because we can encounter Jesus today. We can encounter Jesus today. And I'm amazed by this next verse. It says that the woman left her jar and went away into town, saying to the people, come see a man who told me all that I have ever done. Can this be the Christ? So now just imagine this woman knowing her history and knowing her past, running into town, saying, come see a man. All the people in the town must have been, oh, another one, (laughs) another man. There's another man (laughs) now. So this is not news. This is how she rolls. This is how she rolls. But essentially what happens here is that there's a difference because she goes into town saying, come see a man. He said everything I've ever done. But the fact of the matter is this, is that this man was completely different to all the men she was used to. All the men she was used to actually they actually drew away from her, but Jesus added to her. Jesus actually gave her back and not actually taking back from her. Jesus restored her identity into society. Jesus revealed that that she's loved. There's no reason for her to be shameful. So instead of Jesus actually taking away from her, Jesus added to her. He gave her dignity. He reminded her who she is. And I love this verse here where it says that this woman left her jar. So she came to that well looking for something. She was looking for water and she had her jar. But this woman was so amazed by who she encountered, by what Jesus said to her. She was so amazed by what he had to give her that she left behind what she actually came with. She left her jar right there at that well. See, it's amazing because it is what actually happens, is that when we encounter Jesus, we leave behind everything. We leave behind our experiences, our hurts, our pains. We leave that behind because we realize there's true fulfillment in Jesus. That there's true fulfillment not in the well, but there's true fulfillment in the Savior, and his name is Jesus. So I want to ask you the question this morning is, what jar should you leave behind? So we're finding ourselves here at this well with Jesus this morning. And we've all got a jar. We've all got a jar. Maybe for some of you it might be the approval of man, fear, anxiety. There's so many jars in this room. So I want to ask you the question this morning, what jar should you leave behind? So what is the jar you need to leave and say, you know what? I'm so amazed by this Jesus. I just read about this woman and she left behind everything. She started at that well, a skeptic. She didn't know who this man was. But when she encountered who he actually was, she was amazed because he added so much value to her life. He revealed to her that there's no reason for you to hide. There's no reason for you to hide yourself away because God knows you, that you are fully known and you're fully loved. Jesus reveals to this woman that society might shame you or say certain stuff about you, but I actually say that you are fully known and that you are fully loved. So there's no reason for you to hide. And he also reveals to her that that you gotta be real about where you find yourself. You need to say, God, I actually, I've been finding myself here at this well, drawing water from this well, but it's always leaking. It's never fulfilling. I'm finding myself back there again every single time in pornography, back there again. It's never satisfying me. I'm, I'm, I, wanna, I wanna please people, but, it, but it's never satisfying me. It's only leaving me wanting more. So I want to ask you that question this morning. What jar should you leave behind? What jar should you leave here this morning? Is that this woman, she came to that well one way, but she left that well a completely new person because she realized, you know what? Relationship after relationship, but still finding myself wanting more. It's not satisfying me. 
So what jar should you leave behind this morning? I have some jars. I've got many of them. And I'm going to leave them here this morning. Because you just find yourself so sick looking for a quick fix. You find yourself so tired, wanting more, never satisfying. But I actually want that living water that's flowing from the inside. I don't want a temporal fix. I don't want to come back here again. I'm here now, so I might as well deal with it now. So what do you have to deal with now so that you don't have to come back? I don't mean to church. You have to come back to church, okay? But you got to come back to that well. So what do you have to leave behind? What jar should you leave behind this morning? I'm going to ask us all to stand this morning.